it's just financial. It's not real. And then, well, let's see what happens at the gas station the next day. I, I mean, yeah, it's going to be shorter. You just, it's like I, I have this now, this trip, and I told you before we started to record, I'm seriously concerned. I might not have oil to drive. If, if Russia closed the pipes, that's it. I think there will be oil shortages in Europe. Maybe they have strategic reserves, so maybe they would still be for some weeks, but I don't know. Like 40% of the oil in Europe, 40% of the gas, uh, like 40 plus percent of the wheat and grains. That is like, you can't cut that out and expect it will be definitely shortages. And like we said before, uh, so what I think is that this sanction are leveraged against whoever is implying them. So European and Europeans are implying sanction against Russia. For every one point that they hurt Russia, I think they're hurting themselves like five or 10. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the leverage is against them. And we're going to, we might find the physical limitations of commodities. And maybe then we'll have true price discovery. And who knows where gold and silver is going to go. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcadia Economics. I did a quick update this morning about how the bond market is getting absolutely destroyed right now on the day and really over the last three weeks. And in terms of the reasons why, I thought what better way to explain it than to rebroadcast this incredible interview that Rafi Farber did on his channel, which you'll want to go there and hit the subscribe button to. Um, and he had an interview with Ron Gavrielli, who's been following the Russian-Ukraine situation quite closely and all ties in. They talked about nickel, silver, inflation, shortages, what's going on, how people can prepare. So I thought that would be really helpful. Fortunately, they allowed me to share it. And with that said, here we go. Hey guys, Rafi from the Young Investor and today, I am interviewing Ron Gavrielli, a friend of mine who's in Sweden, and he is moving soon to a different place and wish him a safe journey uh, in what is a very unstable world. Hopefully he can make it without running out of gas. First, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, second is that the world is absolutely crazy. That's if I have to say it in like one sentence. Uh, and I totally think we are approaching the end game with huge steps. Well, I, I just wanted to open with one with, with an observation <laughs> that I've that a general observation that I have, but that I'm seeing um, more acutely now. Um, I've been reading about this nickel squeeze, right? And the, the, the articles are like, this is a purely a financial thing having to do with margin calls, and it doesn't have to do with anything in the physical market. Th th this is like a it, this is a fallacy that um, that Keynesians and econometricians and people who see finance as just like equations in math, totally disconnected from any human action, they want to separate the financial reality of of the economy, the 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 math that you know tallies who has what goods and services and who had because finances they represent potential goods and services, they represent savings that are real. When these things happen, when you have these margin calls and and nickel goes, well, I don't know, what was it, like doubled in the space of a day or two. And people say, oh, this is just, this is just the structure of the financial system has to be cleared out. And, uh, you know, physical reality is fine, but that's not, that's not it. The financial reality reflects physical reality. And the thing is, the prices of all these goods are a lie because the derivatives that set the price in the futures market are a lie because they don't represent physical reality, whereas people are accounting them as if they do. So that means at some point, the whole thing snaps and the price has to go back to what physical reality should be, which is somewhere way up there when all the, when all the shorts get covered by force. And then you have the, the mechanisms of the financial reality being forced to conform to physical reality. That's what's happening. But nobody wants to admit it until we run out of all this stuff. I totally agree. This is exactly the problem. This is, there is a disconnect between physics and reality and uh, what we are being told and uh, what we believe. And this entire situation in Russia and the sanction and everything is just, it presents just that. So for example, I see like people saying Russia is a GDP less than Texas. And that's like tiny, they say, like it's a tiny, it's like a Spain. But that's only with the commodity price at the current price. What if commodities, what if the real price of commodities is twice 
the, the, that of today? Or what if it's 10 times that of today? And that's the, that's the real power that they hold. It's just not represented in the numbers. Yeah, and but, it, it, works, it works the other way around too. Like, what if, you know, America's economy is based on financialized crap, right, mostly? So like, what if, what if the true price of all these securities that America markets and all the derivatives that they market to the world and the dollar that they export to the world, what if the true value of all that stuff is 10 times lower than it is now and the, the, the price of commodities that Russia markets is 10 times higher? I'm just making up numbers, but like, you know, th it, things could be a lot different in, in, real, in reality than they are on paper. And the paper is going to reflect that soon enough and the, 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 other, the other thought that I had was I'm trying to go, like, go, go back to any generation, even a, a generation ago or two generations ago, three generations ago, and I just have them peek in, just, just you know, the, the, the wise men of that generation, have them just peek in for a second as to how the world is behaving now, as to America is behaving, as to how Europe is behaving right now. And just, I just want to hear them comment going on the past two years into now, how stupid can we possibly be? What would they even say about how people, how world leaders are behaving these days? It's just insane. There, there's no, there's no connection with far. reality I anywhere. Just, I think if you get someone from 20 years ago and he went into a coma and he woke up today, I think he would be shocked. <sighs> with, with, would you, would you imagine that we are like in a situation where people couldn't leave their homes for like, you know, in the past two years, everything that we have been going through? I mean, we are totally living in a totally different world. Just 20 years ago, it was totally different. But uh, if you brought one of these smart people from, let's say, uh, five generations ago, so let's say 100 years ago or something, I think they wouldn't, especially if you brought someone who has like, understand, no, they, they just wouldn't understand what's going on. Like things are fake. Like uh, the finance things are fake. The, the prices are fake. The money is fake. Uh, everything is fake. And uh, I think that's why it was, for me at least, easy to spot that I, I became very sensitive to, to see that all the media is trying to push a narrative. So, for example, with this Russia-Ukraine war, there is obviously a narrative from the very beginning. And that made me suspect that, you know, even that is 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 not what we are being told. It's not... It's like things are fake. Everything is lies. Personally, I have no idea what's going on. I, I'm not even going to pretend to know. I just, I don't trust the Ukrainian side. I don't trust the Russian side. I don't want anything to do with it, but there, I have no choice because everything's tied up. Uh, <laughs> but like my, my, my initial thought, and I guess you can reflect on this, is like, what is the point of NATO? What is the point of gathering all these countries under a nuclear umbrella to threaten Russia? Why, why should... Why does it have to be America versus Russia? What, what is the point of all these sides? Why can't we just, it, it seems kind of stupid. Why can't we all just get along? Well, what is the point of all these like alliances? I, I don't understand. Well, that, that is maybe above my pay grade to, <laughs> to understand why they're doing that. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I don't know. They're doing so many irrational things. Um, why, why are they inflate? Okay, why are they inflating that is easier to understand? Why? I mean, they are earning from it. Uh, they are staying in power for it. So I guess it would be the same about this war. I mean, they, they give a reason for their existence. They give a reason for spending. And I guess there is all these kind of powers pulling the strings, you know, uh, the military industrial complex pulling for one part. And maybe, uh, you know, the weapons company, they want to have a conflict because they can sell more weapons. So I guess it may be, if you don't look at it from conspiracy point of view, which I try not to, where, you know, everything is connected and there is this mastermind, then I guess it just fits with the, fits mm. with, uh, you know, uh, with a lot of groups like weapon companies, it's good for them and politicians stay in power and they can say, oh, we are so strong. You know, we are strong against Russia. We are like a strong leader. So I guess that's where it's coming from. That, that's what I would think. And uh, if we get to this Russia situation, I think we should divide it into two things. One is that the misinformation about what is this war about? And then it doesn't matter what it's about. The end result is that commodity prices are going higher. There might be shortages. And this is where what we are talking about, where the physical reality meets, like you meet the wall and all these fake and lies have to like, they have to implode. Like, uh, like the lies in Afghanistan. There was lies for like, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years. They're there. They're trying to fix the place. 
And then in one week, everything crumbles away and you understand there is nothing. There is nothing. Everything has been one big lie. Yeah. The government is not really government. The military can't, can't secure the place and the Taliban uh, takes over everything. So I think with the financial system, it will be the same. So yeah. if we just talk about this Russia, for example, so what the Russians are saying, and I tend to believe that's true and because it's consistent. So when, when I saw all this news about Russia, I had a feeling that someone is pushing a narrative because we've been, I've been trained in the last two years to, to sense that uh, <laughs> with the reality that we live in. And uh, so I started, I, I wanted to investigate. I didn't go to the Russia TV to, to understand what they're saying. I went and I searched for, uh, you know, for the information. I found a professor from the United States. His name is uh, uh, John uh, Marshmeyer. I'm not sure if I know the name exactly. And he explained that situation. Uh, and he predicted everything that is happening now. He predicted already like, I don't know, 12, uh, 12 years ago. And he was also not the only one. So there was other people that predicting that this thing is going to happen. And what they're basically saying is that Russia sees uh, NATO expansion into Ukraine as an existential threat to them. And whether that's true or not, that's how they see the situation. Um, and they're going to respond to that. And they have been trying to make diplomatic talks over the past 20 years. But obviously, in the early 2000s, they were uh, super weak and super poor. They just came out from the uh, USSR. They... They were on the verge of like civil war. They couldn't, they were not strong to make any demand. So they said that, you know, they were not good with the expansion, but they couldn't say anything. And then NATO expanded in 2008. He added like Estonia and uh, I think Latvia and all these countries around there. And again, the Russians in 2008, they were not strong enough to make any line in the sand and say enough. And I guess Putin was building their economy and, you know, he was, I guess, you know, trying to... Uh, you know, when you are in the rock bottom, I mean, you, have, you need to go up. So uh, obviously yeah. such a big country with so many people and so many resources. Uh, so if you just don't fuck up everything, it, it will get better. Um, and then in 2014, um, the NATO made it clear they want to add Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, uh, not Georgia, uh, Georgia. So that's uh, Georgia is the country. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Gruzium. Yeah, south, south of, of Russia. They're next to, to uh, Turkey. So uh, that immediately started the war between Russia and Georgia because that was it. Like Russia wanted to make sure NATO is not expanding not to Georgia and not to Ukraine. And the reason for that is they don't want nuclear weapons to be placed there. And the reason that they don't want nuclear weapons to be placed there is that there is a concept. It's called uh, mutual destruction theory. So if one side is like going to shoot nukes on you, you're like detecting it with your systems and you're going to shoot nukes on them and you're both destroying each other so you don't have uh, you no one want to do that. Like you don't want to kill yourself. But yeah. if your nukes are like really really close, then the amount of time that the missile take to like hit you it's so short. So if new if Ukraine has missiles, they can hit Moscow in like four three minutes. So yeah. you have no time to respond. They can theoretically nuke nuke you your cities and all of your and all of your missiles. So you can't respond and you are like you're out of the picture. So that's why. Ukraine is so important. And uh, also in 2014, the Russia took uh, cream. That was also in response to this uh, NATO wanting to uh, get Ukraine to join uh, uh, to join NATO. And also what they did, and again, look, they are not so like nice. They started the civil war there in the area that is called Donbass. That is an area that is on the southeast of Ukraine. So obviously a lot of, uh, most of that area is ethnically Russian. And those people want to be part of Russia. So obviously Russia is supplying them weapons and they're helping them to do this civil war. And the, the reason for that is because NATO has rules and the rules say if a country has a dispute over its territory, it cannot join NATO. So then they gained the, their objective. Ukraine couldn't join NATO and uh, you know they showed that they are not okay with it. But uh, what, the West, what the West did later is, okay, we can't uh, let Ukraine join for now. We're just going to arm it, you know, until the neck, you know, just giving them a lot of weapons. So it's like they are, it's almost like they're members of NATO because they're going to have so much uh, military equipment. And also uh, in 2021 in March, so exactly one year ago, Zelensky said he want to take back Crim from Russia, which is basically like a... Uh, saying you are at war with them. And uh, just like two months ago, he said he want to purchase nuclear weapons 
And no one even like, not Macron, not Joe Biden, no one of them like said, well, well you are crazy. Because I think deep down inside, they know if he purchased nuclear weapons, it's going to be pointed at Russia, which is something that they want. So maybe that, that is the, what I read. And I tend to believe that this is correct. And uh, so, again, what the media is trying to tell us is like, Ukraine good, Russia is bad. And it's uh, like Putin just want to create a greater Russia. And it's that simple. And there is not like a real reason behind it. Um, but uh, I believe that story that I heard from uh, John Marshmeyer, especially since it's consistent, because Russia has been trying diplomatically to make Ukraine into some kind of a buffer state where they don't join NATO and they, they're just natural, you know, like Switzerland. And that didn't really work out. So mm -hmm. I think it's consistent and that's why I think it's true. Um, and also, interestingly, uh, now uh, we heard that uh, Russia announced that they found bio labs that were developing bio weapons in Ukraine. And may you may think that's like a complete lie and bullshit. But the next day, Victoria Newland coming out in Congress and she's being asked, is there bio labs in Ukraine? She say, yeah, we have bio labs in Ukraine. We are funding them. And she's saying something uh, along the lines, if there is a bioweapon attack, it's the Russians. And it sounds sketchy, you know, sketchy as hell. Um, so obviously both sides are not, are not so good. And if there is really bioweapons, that's like the reason why uh, USA invaded Iraq. That's like uh, weapons of mass destruction. So I guess that's kind of um, make the invasion legitimate, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, if we just go right back to the financial part of things, we are seeing yeah. all this sanction happening and we are going to reach uh, the physical limitation of things. Because if there was only like, let's say 4% disruption in oil that is supposed to come to Europe, that would be like something huge, something huge, 4% of the entire production of all, uh, uh, imports of uh, oil in Europe, uh, if they would go missing, that would be like gigantic. You would you would see uh, prices skyrocketing. Yeah, I mean, but we are if, talking what about what like just happened forty in nickel, plus. Like for example, what if what just happened in nickel? How many shorts are there in the oil market, and they're getting crushed? What if you have like a short squeeze in oil that brings it up to like four hundred dollars a barrel in a day? I mean, I can see that happening. And go, oh, it's just fine. It, but it, it's just financial. It's not real. And then, well, let's see what happens at the gas station the next day. I, I mean. Yeah, it's going to be shorter. You just It's like I, I, I have this now, this trip, and I told you before we started to record, I'm seriously concerned I might not have oil to drive. If, if Russia closed the pipes, that's it. I think there will be oil shortages in Europe. Maybe they have strategic reserves, so maybe they would still be for some weeks, but I don't know. Like 40% of the oil in Europe, 40% of the gas, uh, like 40 plus percent of the wheat and grains. That is like, you can't cut that out and expect it will be definitely shortages. And like we said before, uh, so what I think is that these sanctions are leveraged against whoever is implying them. So European and Europeans are implying sanction against Russia. For every one point that they hurt Russia, I think they're hurting themselves like five or 10. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the leverage is against them. And we're going to, we might find the physical limitations of commodities and maybe then we'll have true price discovery and who knows where gold and silver is going to go uh, in that case I, I'm a, I also try not to go into the realm of there's one mastermind to all this plan it seems like it seems like chaos to me it seems like they're just warring power centers that are all trying to like eke out their own territory and it's just creating a mess I, I don't think there's any single thing behind it I mean we can point to Klaus Schwab because like He's got a convenient World Economic Forum that has all this crazy stuff that it's saying. But how much is he really in charge of things? I have no idea. And even I think in, he's another warring power. I mean, he's another yeah. one. And that's what I think. Yeah, but I mean, if 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 this does lead to, you know, uh, serious commodity trouble and the quadrupling of prices, like what you know, if 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 what happened in nickel happens in all other commodities in the next few weeks. And that leads to the overthrow of all these these petty European dictators that impose lockdowns on everyone and social distancing and all this nonsense. And they get overthrown. You know what? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mourn about it. You know, maybe they deserve that. I'm I mean I'm not I'm not rooting for any kind of revolution. I'm not that kind of guy. But uh, there's some reckoning that needs to be done over the past two years of hell that we've all been through. 
And, you know, I'll, I'll let God decide how he's going to do it. But uh, I think all the pieces are in place for all these political leaders to suffer and to have justice be meted out to them. And I'm just watching here from the safety of hopefully the safety of my backwater town in Israel that I hope nobody ever goes to or pays attention to. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that's exactly my plan. I try to move now to the countryside and have some kind of land where I can grow some things. And uh, because I think the best way to pass this is to have your gold and silver as, you know, wealth protection and also for, I, I would rather not use it for barter if I don't have to. So I, I don't want to stick out. So if I can yeah. like grow my own stuff and keep the my, my real wealth for after things settle down and then converted to other things that that's what i want to do yeah i mean just imagine imagine what would happen to the western world <clears throat> if you know for example let's say electricity prices were to quadruple in a day in a short squeeze and then an, an, inter an internet company couldn't pay its electric bills and then you had an internet down and then and then like russia cuts some undersea cable and then you have you know you have no internet for a week for the whole world what would what pe people are so addicted you know, look at us. We're talking on the internet right now. I mean, this is my, this is our communication. Communications could be down. It could really lead to some serious panic and riots all over the world if that happened. The the, the connectivity. I mean, this these are these are things that that I could see actually happening now, and and um, it's it's making me nervous. Uh, and for that reason, I I recommend that everyone have enough food and uh, and energy in their homes for at least a few weeks just to not have to go out and you know, peek your head out and see what's going on. Maybe you want to stay at home and, and wait for things to calm down. If that, if that eventually things will calm down. I just don't know what happens in the middle. And I, I, I try not to think about it, but I keep thinking about it. Yeah. And you know, also plans that people make may not, uh, you know, some, how do, how do you say it? Like uh, things that we believe may change. So for example, I read this on Twitter and I was shocked. So this guy, uh, I just have it in front of me now. So this guy lives in, um, let me just see. Um, so he writes like that. A friend of mine just paid $58 to supercharge his uh, Tesla 3 in Alberta. Okay, it's in Alberta. And he filled his uh, Toyota RAV4 and cost him his $66. Almost the same. He says he gets 410 kilometers and I get 700. He took one and uh, 30 minutes to to charge and I took three minutes. So electric cars used to be super cheap to like fill up, you know, their electricity, but electricity costs, like they went ballistic. Electricity is like a few times higher and fuel cost is maybe what? 40% higher, 50% higher. So yeah. suddenly it becomes that electric cars are going to be more expensive to run than fuel driven cars. So people make plans. They don't even know, like things can change like, like that. Didn't take uh, 20 years. It took like what, six months? No, even not even that, three months. And suddenly electric cars are more expensive. I mean, so yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. By the way, I want to ask uh, you something, Graffy, yeah. uh, about this margin call. So I experienced this margin call in one company that I own. It's called Peabody Energy. Uh, Peabody Energy, it's a call producer. And call mm -hmm. went up from like, I don't know, in like one week, in one week, it went up from like two, 220 to like 440. Right. Uh, after it already had a run before. So six months ago, it was maybe 140. And it is now at 440. So this company got margin called on their hedge position. And what they did is they went to Goldman Sachs and got a credit line for $150 million. So they can put it against, uh, against the hedge. Right. But now it made me think like, as long as everything is good, and, and this company is like minting money right now, um, like three weeks ago, they made a release that their fourth quarter of 2021, they had $550 million of net income. And the entire company was worth back then like $1.5 billion. So in one quarter, they made like a third of their, uh, of their worth. Right. So they're, they're earning a lot of money, but they don't have a lot of money at hand. So right. as long as everything good and there is like banks... They can go to the bank and get the credit line and everything works nice with this derivative. But what happens in the end game when the banks are going is a company yeah. like that, which is basically like a really good company, like earn a lot of money. It's in the right trade. It's in commodities. Commodities are going up and it can go bankrupt. So that's what that made me a little bit scared. Like not only for that, for, for other companies. 
Uh, what do you think about that? Right. Well, I, I have two, two thoughts. Um, first of all, um, when it, just before we get to the banks, the, this thing that happened in nickel, I'm, I'm trying to like, I'm just, I'm just like pushing it through my head and trying to find the logical uh, extensions in different directions of where things could go, what makes sense. And uh, what I've come up with is that, look, if, if let's say a, any commodity company that, that sells a commodity, uh, whatever, fertilizer, coal, I don't care what it is, and they see what happened to, to nickel, to these nickel mining companies, and uh, you know they stayed alive too, but they lost a, you know they lost a chunk. They, there's still this uh, Australian nickel stock that's still going down today because of these margin calls. Um, but if other if other companies that are hedged against their commodity that they produce, they don't want to get caught in in these short squeezes, so they're going to start covering their contracts now before there's another short squeeze. But that, that's going to spread across the whole commodity sector where producers of the commodity are not going to want to be hedged anymore or as much. And the, the fact that they're going to be covering their contracts is what's going to bring the commodity price up because the act of covering shorts is going to mean buying is going to mean the commodity goes up. So that's, that itself is going to lead the entire commodity complex higher. If I was a CEO of a, uh, of a coal mining company, I'd say, look, I don't want to, I don't want to hedge coal anymore or, or as much. It's too dangerous. Like, what, what can happen to you? Um, but when, you, when you're talking about the banks themselves, yeah. So when... First of all, when any single company is having a margin call on like Peabody, they can go to Goldman Sachs and Goldman Sachs be glad to give them the money because they know that they got, you know, they got the cash flows because the commodity is going crazy. They're going to make so many sales. Um, but if it's happening to every commodity at the same time and everyone's asking Goldman Sachs for a whole bunch of money, the Fed's going to have to come in. You know, they can get, they can get, uh, they can get liquidity from the Fed directly, maybe, who knows, but that, that's, you know, that's a crazy thought. Um, but when it comes to gold and silver, right? Um, the way I, I understand it, I'm not 100% sure I'm right on this, but I think from what I remember seeing in different COT ports, reports for different commodities, the bulk of the shorts in gold and silver are the banks themselves, whereas the producers are only a small part of the shorts. Um, in other commodities, it's mostly pr the producers that are short and secondarily the banks, the market making banks. So once you get to gold and silver, um, it's the banks themselves that are going to have the short squeeze and they're going to have to go to the Fed and the Fed's going to have to bail them out. And if the Fed does bail them out, then the, the price of gold and silver is going to, you know, the banks will survive. Yeah, they will give them all this cash and they're going to go and buy all the shorts and they're going to yeah. push the and price they, higher. He said, yeah. And if they, and if they don't, the, bank, so... the banks collapse. E either way, the price of gold and silver skyrockets. Uh, and either, either the banks collapse uh, and, uh, and the dollar survives or the banks survive and the dollar collapses. There's no, there's no other way out of it. Um, but yeah, go, gold and silver should be the last two commodities to have this short squeeze, but they will get there. And uh, we should start seeing dominoes fall on other commodities. And then finally, it should get to gold and silver, and that should be the end. Yeah, I think it's time for, if people don't have physical, it's time to, to get some physical or even to convert. Like, I'm thinking converting now the some paper stuff for, for the physical stuff <laughs> because everything that was going on. This, this, you start to feel like how this third party risk like uh, exists and in the gold and silver, when you have it in your home or when you have it in a vault, like that's it. It, it, you own it and that's it. There is nothing more. Yeah, the danger, the danger there is the government's gonna come after you and just confiscate it. So that if, if that happens, I mean, there's, there's nothing really I can do. I, mean, I can't stop them. Um, I, th I think they would go after minor first. It's easier, like you can just tax the hell out of them. and. No, I hope at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not, nothing is nothing is a hundred percent safe uh, right now. Well, look at at, at this point. Um, you know, uh, our, our holiday perm is coming up, and uh, look, uh, per, perm perm is about a bad guy who basically thought he was in control the whole time, and he seems cool and in control the whole time, and then all the, he didn't realize that the entire time that he thought he was in control, he really wasn't. He was being controlled by you know a force up above. Uh, so that, that's, that's how I try to look at the situation here. You know, you, you have these nefarious uh, parties and people who think they can control the whole system and they think they've got it all figured out, but really they're just being played. The, we're, the, we're, both, we're two sides of the same coin. There's the good guy and there's the bad guy. Really, we're just playing a script here. And we choose our sides and the good, so the good side has to move according to its values to try to counter the bad side. But uh, really, it's not really up to us. It's up to a, a greater power here. And, you know, that's how... That's how I uh, try to stay calm. 
because really, what, what do I know? I'm just trying to do the best I can and trying to be a good person. And um, maybe I, I hope that's all that God wants from you because that's all I can do. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I tend to have the same uh, outlook on things like you. And we're just going to have to sit and watch things happen. <laughs> at least at least we understand that it's coming. I mean, we're not going to be hit in the face in surprise. Yeah. So uh, hold on tight. Yeah. It's getting, it's getting interesting. And i um, just trying to keep a smile on my face and wait for it to come. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. All right, Ron. It was good talking to you. And uh, thanks for your insight on Russia and Ukraine, what you understand from what's going on there. And uh, have a happy endgame and a good move. And uh, I will talk to you soon. Well, thank you, as always, for being here. Thank you, Rafi, for letting me rebroadcast that great call. And if you'd like to get access to Rafi's column that comes out daily, it's one of my favorite reads each day. And actually, I am a subscriber. This is just a different browser where I'm not logged in. But... If you would like to get access to that and the great things that Rafi writes in between his weekly silver reports, well, click in the link below. With that said, I'll see you again soon.